Welcome back to the Corner of the Seed podcast. We've got an off the cob episode for you. This is the year we're seeing several folks around Iowa, Illinois, um, reporting what seems to be a strange issue. And that's where the tassels uh, won't unfurl. And it can leave fields with uh, body pollination, and which obviously ties into some low yields. So today I'm on a quick phone call with uh, Craig Alleman, our lead agronomist, so we can just dive into this mystery, um, wrap our head around this, and um, dive in a little bit and get Craig's perspective. So welcome, Craig. Hey, good morning, Juan. Good morning. So what are, uh, I understand you're getting lots of calls right now, and and um, there's some things to keep an eye on. What, what are you hearing out there? Yeah, so we started getting... Uh, some calls last week, some concerns, a uh, customer uh, a little further south here in Illinois, so central Illinois, and they are noticing that their tassels are not coming out, I would say, normally. Um, and it looks like the what we generally would call the flag leaf, the leaf that is actually wrap, wrapped around the tassel as it's coming up the plant is not letting that tassel come out normally or the tassel is not maybe extending how it needs to be to uh, to get that that process done. Um, it looks like when that happens, you got maybe the main branch, you know, the center of the tassel will make its way out, but the other branches have not come out yet. So you don't have a fully developed tassel. Still probably dropping plenty of, of pollen once it makes it out. But the second thing they're noticing are the silks are abnormally long. And I've had some pictures come in here this morning. I mean, they're longer than the ear on some of them already. So six, eight inches at least. Um, the silks will grow until they are fertilized by the pollen. So when when that pollen, you know, gets in there and actually um, uh, enters the silk tube, that, then it stops growing. So if they're if they're six, eight inches long, that means they, you know, they haven't had pollen in that normal time frame when they would usually get it. What we worry about there is that will, you know, will that pollen get to all the silks and the, the ones underneath, you know, if, if that pollen doesn't get in underneath and behind those silks, that they would be the, the ones of concern. A pollen doesn't, it's not going to enter the, the end of the tube necessarily. Anywhere on the silk tube itself, if that pollen lands, you're good to go. It's going to fertilize that silk, which in turn fertilizes a, a kernel on down at the end of the silk. So um, that that is the concern is why why are my uh, silks so long and why are these tassels not coming out? And that, I'm sure it's probably happened before because probably nothing that we've seen ever happens before. But I haven't I don't re remember in recent uh, history when in our area anyway we've had this uh, this phenomenon with the tassels being you know not allowed to come out normally. Well, and something that that's kind of interesting because when, when we will pique my interest in this and just being on social media as I started seeing posts um, either from Indiana or, or Missouri. And, you know, our, our footprint isn't, uh, you know, we're just at pollination stage, right? For some or not as further ahead. So, so I was wondering if we'd see it, then, then your communication came out. And it sounds like, like you mentioned, there's two things going on here. There's the, the tight tassel wrap, I guess, for lack of a better, better word, where it won't unfurl. And then extra long silking. You send out a couple articles. Is there anything around this that's, is it environmental? Is it genetic? Um, what's kind of like, I guess, the general school of thought, you, you did say anything that we've seen, we've, we've usually seen before in some form or fashion, right? I guess, what, what does history tell us? Yeah, and you, so you, we don't know yet. I mean, there's probably plenty of guesses out there, and I've seen some guesses, but a lot of times these things will be genetically related, so it might you know, might boil down to one genetic family or, you know, a, a female or a male or two, something like that, that will end up pinning down eventually, but too early to be doing that for sure. Um, but w that's, that's one of the things that we'll look, that we'll look at as, as time goes on here. And, um, the important thing is how good is the pollination going to be? I have seen some, you know, some indications that, uh, we're getting some of those zippered ears, which may indicate some of those silks on the backside did not get pollinated. Um, and if that's the case, you know, we're simply going to lose yield. So if if that's over a widespread area, then the, the guys up there in Chicago need to get that built into their computer models um, because that's going to be a definite issue on overall yield. Um, we did 
you know, I've, I've heard most of the activity kind of over in Eastern Illinois early on, but I've got calls now this morning out into Iowa, Cedar Rapids area, Eastern Iowa, where they're seeing some of the same thing. Um, one of the DSM set a, a picture in where it looks like the pollination has probably occurred and is, is okay. Um, that can be different. That can be a difference by hybrid too. Is that ear upright? Is it, does it lay over, you know, are the pollen is going to be able to get into those silks on the underside or not. Um, so we will see some differences, but, um, that's what we're going to do probably over the next week or so, um, uh, because we, we ought to know the success of the, you know, the pollination and see if we're missing kernels, if we're going to have some blank areas on those ears, um, by just doing a, you know, simple shack in the back and doing a shake test. Cause those, those silks will detach from the, the kernels once they've been pollinated. Um, so that's, that's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see what the actual effect is, but I think already it's a big enough area where there is going to be some detriment to the yield. Absolutely. You know, like we, 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 we typically like to get on here and talk about, um, just keep folks informed, right? Ideally agron agronomically and keep, um, keep you focused and, and this, no one likes to talk about something. It's like, Hey, this is, this is about it. potential lose yield, especially you know, uh, like you mentioned, the whole zipper ear, or if you're missing a row or two, you, you can do some pretty quick math and, and realize that it's a, it could be a, a, a significant ding to the bushels. And I think just when I think about our perspective is, you know, it's about protecting your profits now, right? You, you want to go out there and you want to scout, and you want to assess, and, and that way you can work with the right people to position your marketing plan and your marketing strategy, right? Hey, will, will the markets adapt to this? And we're not market people and I'm not trying to even give advice, but that's why it's important to go out there and scout. Yeah, it's all, it's all part of it. And that, that is some of the questions I have got from farmers is I'm getting ready to put on my fungicide. If I'm not going to have the yield out there that, that I expected, do I need to, or do I want to put on that added expense? And there's, I guess, a couple of ways of looking at that. You know, I, I think the fungicide application at the R1, you know, which is the silking time frame, um, you know, I think it has a lot to do with helping our kernel depth. And, you know, if we have fewer kernels, then, you know, that year by itself is going to go ahead and flex those kernels a bit, you know, but getting that added kernel depth is maybe, maybe how, how we keep some profitability in that acre, but it's, it's a tough decision that's going to be up to the individual farmer to make, but that's some of the things we'd think about. Absolutely. So then as it comes down to, we've talked about the scope with this, which is, it seems to be, you know, if you're growing corn, you, you, you know, there, there might be something to go out there and look at least in our, in our footprint. And then, um, what you talked about, we've got tight tassel wrap, and then we've also have the, um, the, the long silking and something that we won't cover now that I think was really cool you shared with the team was that a lot of the hybrids that have been bred to to handle drought conditions um, are bred to to excessively silk. So in conditions where the weather um, has been cooperating and great, they, they might look abnormally larger. I think that was a Purdue study you sent, but we won't have to hit that here. I, we'll, we can cover it in our next show we do um, very soon. But so we've got long silking, tight tassel wrap. Uh, we're, we're telling folks just go out there and assess it so can, you can get your, your game plan together. And something that you said that now I'm thinking about is, is there any other immediate actions that someone can do? Obviously, you can't walk across the field and help, help the tassel unfurl unless it's a sweet corn patch. Um, other than, than just keeping an eye on it and and maybe, you know, help with an application of something to help with the seed set, uh, the depth there. Anything else that you're. No, and, and that, that work you're talking about was Bob Nielsen. He's, in my opinion, the best corn guy God ever put on this earth. And he's done a lot of good work. And he was talking about how we've bred to be drought tolerant. We bred aggressive silk. Um, silk emergence into some of these hybrids and then under really good growing conditions they get they get aggressive enough that maybe they get out and get going a little quicker than they should so that that would be interesting for somebody to look up but i don't think there's anything that we can do that's realistic to help this out it's going to be what it's going to be and uh, the way the crop come along it's going to be real 
real rapidly, we're going to know what the result is. So I think it's, uh, you know, I, I guess things were looking pretty good, you know, growing season wise. And I, I've said this a million times, that it's a long, long time till harvest. It'll be interesting to see what kind of a shoe drops between now and then. And yeah. maybe, maybe we're looking at it here. I, I think we're looking at it. And one, one last comment, I'm a simple guy and I, a simple minded guy. And I think about, I, I would, I would agree with <laughs> I think about, uh, I'm glad you do. Uh, I think about, uh, you know, there's times where even through the seed corn operation, which is different growing hybrid seed corn versus uh, commercial field corn is, uh, deploy a helicopter out there to, to encourage, um, some pollination. Fortunately for us, or unfortunately it's been, it's been windy and we most folks have weathered the recent storms pretty good that have gone across the center of the country. Um, is that, am I crazy to think that, that like, hey, if you're thinking you want to encourage your pollination, go fly a drone over it or, or get some wind on it? Oh, yeah. And that, I mean, that, that is something that physically would do it. If you disturbed, you know, you got wind down in there shaking that plant, not only are you shaking pollen off, but you're, you know, you're moving it around and you could get it in behind those long silks. But I did mention that there's nothing realistically that we can do. Yeah, that's so. a good point. That would, that would be quite expensive. Yeah, no, that's, that's true. That's a valid point. So, well, um, I, I think that's, that's it, Craig. I know, you, you know, you mentioned we'll, we'll plan to get another one with some more visuals and, and, and give it that format. Um, but really for us, our recommendation is just go out there and scout. Um, th there'll be a scouting plan to assess it and to look at it. There's varying degrees of impact, like you said, whether it's, um, you know, the, the zipper to ear or, or different type of pollination effects. Um, and I think when we encourage this, we also talk about everything we do for this year and, and, and it's always to make notes for next year, right? So spread your risk, you know, diversify your hybrid selections, make sure that, that we're not pigeonholed to just one, um, one product out there. And so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If, if this turns out to be kind of, you know, a narrow genetic type of thing, that's the reason why we, we, that's the reason why we carry genetics from everybody and why we recommend a variety of genetics so that we spread the risk around. Cause you, you're just never going to know, but yeah, if you want to see some more stuff, we're going to do a full blown video podcast on this and we're going to have, it looks like I have a ton of pictures of currently what's going on and some links to different articles to read and everything. So definitely stay tuned for that. Perfect. Thanks, folks. Well, until the next one.